Hi. So, if you've been watching the previous four, you might notice the lighting's changed. Um, it's really dark. I didn't realize how late it got. But anyway, so I'm trying to do it with as much natural light as I can. Um, but I've got like the big light on now. So yeah. So just sorry for the difference, but this is the only time I have to film it. So. Let's move on from the lighting. So this is the fifth video in the Jack the Ripper series that I've decided to do on the victims of Jack the Ripper. So we've got down to our final victim now, who is Mary Jane Kelly. So Mary Jane Kelly, also known as Marie Jeanette Kelly, was the fifth and final victim of Jack the Ripper. It's probably a good time to go more in depth with this. Should have said it in the first video, but the issue with researching historical people, especially those of the working class, means that records of these people's day-to-day -day lives are quite sparse or inaccurate or don't exist at all. So to build a full picture of someone who did not receive international attention or any sort of media attention until their death makes it quite difficult to give accurate findings on them. You're often relying on the accounts of people who knew them or what individuals told their friends or families about themselves. And people of this time, the same as people now, ourselves, we want to present the best image of ourselves that we can. So some details may be embellished or false. And this is particularly true for the case of Mary Jane Kelly. Many of her major life events, as she recounted, have no evidence. For instance, she has no birth certificate, she has no marriage certificate. All of these things have been lost or in terms of the marriage certificate might not have existed in the first place. So it's just something that I thought was important to mention is the fact that you can't guarantee that these accounts are accurate, but I've tried to do my best to compare for different sources to give a full picture of their lives. So the majority of accounts of Mary Jane Kelly were provided by Joseph Barnett, who was her partner. That's just like another thing to bear in mind is that the account being given by a partner might try to seek to put you into a better light. Mary Jane Kelly was born in Limerick, Ireland on the 25th of August, 1863 making her the youngest of the Ripper victims. As you might have noticed, the rest were all born in 1840s. So this is the date of birth given on her gravestone. However, there's lots of different accounts giving her date of birth. So what I'm gonna say is that she was born in the year 1863, but no one's really sure of the actual date of birth. Her father was called John Kelly and he was an iron worker. Details surrounding her mother and who her mother was are unknown. Mary Jane reported that she had seven brothers and one sister and the family moved over to Wales when she was about six or seven. The details of all of her brothers and sisters are also unknown, so there's no proof. Mary Jane's family were described as relatively well-to-do, and so there were suggestions that they might have had some money behind them and that they could support her if she needed them to. At 16, Mary Jane married a collier named either Davis or Davies. So two years after their marriage, at 18, Mary Jane lost her husband in a mining accident. After this, at an unknown date, Mary Jane was reported to have been admitted to hospital for eight months. However, as Hallie Rubenhold suggests in her book on the lives of the Jack the Ripper victims, it would have been highly unlikely that someone would have been in a public hospital for this long. You know, obviously it's, it's funded by the state. They don't really want you in there. They would try to get you in and out as quick as they could. So to be there for eight months and not have like a severe diagnosis or a known diagnosis, there's suggestions that perhaps she was in an asylum, um, which there was kind of a growth of mental health institutions in this period. It could also be suggested that perhaps Mary Jane was pushed into a refuge for fallen women. Okay, my lighting is all over the place. I'm really sorry. We move on. The fact that she might have been pushed into going to a refuge for fallen women might be a suggestion at when she began working as a prostitute. Obviously there's no actual known dates as to when she went into this type of institution or what institution she went into. So again, it's going off assumptions rather than evidence. So a note on the definition of fallen women and the refuges they would go to. Fallen women were women who had sex before marriage, whether this be through choice or against their will. For instance, people who have been raped, prostitutes, just someone who had a relationship before marriage that had sex anything like that they would be put into this type of institution and i found this one pamphlet i found particularly interesting in the national archives website it was a pamphlet published in 1868 any woman who transgressed victorian sexual norms was deemed as needing reform and this reform could be brought about by admitting women into these refuges to provide them with religious and moral instruction to get them out of the situation they are currently in it's believed that sex before marriage could lead to poverty and death 
I know I don't mean to make light of this at all, but this really reminds me of, you know, that scene in Mean Girls. The guy's like, oh, if you have sex before marriage, you will die. That scene, a middle-class philanthropist from the 19th century, twins. Just don't do it, promise? So Mary Jane left Cardiff with a cousin to go to London in 1884. For a while she worked as a high-class prostitute in the upscale West End. She met a gentleman there who apparently liked Mary Jane so much that he took her to France with him. However, after 10 days of being abroad, Mary Jane decided it wasn't for her and came back to the UK. Again, this is something that she said, and there's no evidence to prove that it's right, but equally there's no evidence to prove it's wrong. Mary ended up involved with a man called Joseph Barnett, who was a coal porter. They lived together at 26 Dorset Street, in the Whitechapel area of East London, the same as all of our other victims. This house had been converted into a hotel type of situation. It's a little bit higher class than a common lodging house, in the sense that they didn't have to share a room with other lodgers. They rented the whole room for themselves, but obviously they used communal facilities like the kitchen. Mary Jane and Joseph lived in room 13 on the ground floor. Mary Jane had lost her key for the property and she'd broken a window in the door to allow her to reach through and open the door from the inside. Barnett moved out of the property that he shared with Mary Jane after Mary Jane allowed other sex workers to move into the property as she felt sorry for them and didn't want to see them homeless if they couldn't afford to rent a room they could move in with her and Barnett decided this was inappropriate and was unhappy with this and so he left. I think Mary Jane did the right thing. On November 8th 1888 Mary Jane left Dorset Street at about 6pm to go out and work and was expected back the next day that would be November 9th. One of Mary's neighbours in room 5 a lady called Mary Ann Cox would report that she saw Mary Jane out in the street with a gentleman, but Mary Ann Cox thought nothing of this and just expected to see her the next day when they both finished work. When she arrived back at her accommodation, Mary Jane was reported to have been singing until 1am and after this it went quite quiet. Some people did say that during the course of the night that they heard oh murder being shrieked, however because of the nature of the East End of London and all the crime and things that would happen around there, it wasn't enough to get anyone to stir, like no one was going to wake up and go and investigate and it was only one shout and there wasn't any kind of like screaming and shouting after that so they just left it. So two hours later, at about 3am, Mary Ann Cox returned to room 5 by which point Mary Jane's room was silent. Mary Jane's body was discovered at 11am on the 9th of November 1888 after the assistant landlord, Thomas Boyer, went to go and collect overdue rent money from Mary Jane. Mary Jane's murder was the only Ripper murder scene to be documented by the police in terms of the complete photography of the murder scene, including her body. She was the youngest of the victims at approximately 25 years old. Mary Jane was reported to have been buried in St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Cemetery and that was in the Leighton Stone area in the London Borough of Waltham Forest. And that concludes my fifth and final video on the Jack the Ripper victims. I personally found it very interesting learning the true identities of these people rather than just them being like a number in a series of murders and it just made me really sad really. I think it's important that you award all these women their own voices and that is why I find that I think that it's probably not a good idea for me to follow up with a kind of identity of the Ripper which I was originally considering doing but I think that kind of detracts from the fact that we're trying to separate them being a number and a name in association with the Ripper and having their own identity. So hopefully I help that and someone else will now know the identities of these women. Thank you for watching and um, I'll be back soon with something else I find interesting. If you liked it, give me a follow, subscribe, whatever they call it on this. Anyway, thank you. Bye.